Hello, I'm Chris Christofferson. On November 8, 1965, the 173rd Airborne Brigade on Operation Hump, War Zone D in Vietnam, were ambushed by over 1,200 BC. 48 American soldiers lost their lives. Severely wounded and risking his own life, Lawrence Joel, a medic, was the first living black man since the Spanish-American War to receive the United States Medal of Honor for saving so many lives in the midst of battle that day. Our friend Niles Harris, retired 25 years United States Army, the guy who gave Big Kenny his top hat, was one of the wounded who lived. This song is his story. Caught in the action of kill or be killed, greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his brother. This is the story of Niles Harris. A top hat, a song, a war, and a journey. With Big and Rich's John Rich and Big Kenny, Niles, and the documentary production team, we'll meet new friends and old enemies made long ago on the other side of the world. My name is John Rich. I'm part of the duo Big and Rich. I'm Big Kenny. Uh, I'm from Culpeper, Virginia. My partner, Big Kenny, I uh, met in 1998 in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, two planets of music collided. Save a horse, ride a cowboy. Everybody says, save a horse, ride a cowboy. I love making music, man. I love writing songs. I just, I love the, the whole creative process. Blinging while the girls are drinking. Long necks down. Our music is about things that have really happened to us in our lives, one way or another, whether it's a ultimate party, having a blast, or it's, or it's uh, something really serious, like the 8th of November. Uh, Lay down his life for his brother, does it sound right to you? Yeah, it'll work. Uh, well, better than friend? No, nah, better than brothers. Brothers better? Yeah, yeah. And then lay down his life for his brother. See on the one, take one, marker. Get ready, Chris. Action. You know, uh, I'm wondering how the hell I got here. I don't like any of this. I don't, I, I don't like any of this. And, 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 and I'm, I had no thoughts ever seeing L.A. or anything else. And I was a bartender in Deadwood, South Dakota, in the Buffalo Bar, cool old bar. And about three years or more ago, a Big and Rich come down, and they were playing in the Buffalo. We were just having ourselves a lot of fun. and. And uh, after we had taken a break I get, that night, uh, I noticed this guy back behind the bar that had on this really, really cool hat. I loved it. I thought it was so neat. He uh, took the hat off and hands it to me. I took it thinking, well, he's going to let me wear the hat while I'm playing, you know. So we finished playing that night and uh, got done off the stage. And he had been standing over to the side, you know, up against the wall. And I walk up to him, I take the hat off, and I go, Hey man, thanks for letting me wear your hat. That's awesome. That's so cool. He goes, ha ha, keep it. So that was kind of the thing, I guess, that broke the ice for us. Dead was a neat old gold mine town. There was yeah. over 900 mines around there back in the old days in the area. The next morning, John and I got up. We were staying above the bar in, in a place that used to be a brothel, actually, uh, there in Deadwood, South Dakota. And uh, we'd come down in the mornings. Part of our pay was uh, food and everything we could drink. So we got ourselves some breakfast, of course, and uh, Niles came walking into the, the little room there at the bar and, and uh, just said, hey, you guys ever seen a gold mine before? I told him I'd take him out to some mines, some old mines, and I put him in my Bronco. I got an old Bronco with no back seat and loaded him up. We went out to a, a mine, and on my Bronco, I got a lot of herd patches, 173rd patches and that kind of stuff. And, uh, we started talking, and I uh, uh, told him about the, you know, November 8th, and uh, Lawrence Joe and, and uh, a few of the people, and uh, that's how it all came about. It's led to this story, Niles Harris, the 8th of November, 1965. 
Now the difference between writing this song and other songs is normally Kenny and I would sit down right then as soon as we said, we gotta write a song about that. Normally we would sit down right then, have a couple of beers and write a song. But in this case, it was just, it was so important and, and so important to us, we just wanted to make sure it was right. It's it, it's the pinnacle of what we've written so far. You planted the seed, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you what, bourbon will do that, I guess. We're gonna shoot the main part of the music video. And that, that's two main things that we'll be shooting there in Nashville on a big sound stage. One will be John and Kenny, their performance of the song, and the other is gonna be you going through your 8th of November ritual. It'll be a lot of shooting. I mean, it'll take eight hours probably to shoot you because it'll be like different lenses. I'm not very patient behind that horseshoe. Yeah. And I'm pretty nervous. I don't like it. As you notice, I don't like hanging around uh, uh, that kind of stuff, you know. And, uh, so I guess we'll do what we got to do. They told you you got to wear a wig and, and shave all that shit off your face. Wouldn't mind right? that. I'm, <laughs> I'm in underwear. I'm in underwear, man. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Even better. <laughs> I think, for me, first off, is that it's a real story. It's not just fiction. <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> real No, and I think that is the difference, is that it is a real story, and it's not just a fictional story that's, that's just made up. So therefore, I mean, I find myself treading lightly, you know, because it, we, I don't want to, have to create such a dramatic license that it's not real. We want every single frame in this thing to be real, and that's why I would go up to Niles. Is this how you do it? Is this how, what you wear? What do you do? You know, and try to take his story and make it real. Niles uh, makes it a point every year on the 8th of November to, to dress up, go out, throw one back to all of his buddies and remember them. I have a good bottle of whiskey, and I have a shot out of that, and I put it away. Putting on a suit is, is a sh a little show of respect, but none of those guys ever wore a suit or anything else. I never was in the crying in my beer or anything else over the 8th of November. These guys were all 18 to 20 something who got killed. This isn't woe is me or anything. It's just a respectful drink for them. And then it's uh, like I said, I'm having a good time for them guys. You always know, drink for the boys, you know, <laughs> what the hell, you know. And, uh... I can't help it if some of them had a few more than they should have, you know. I was just helping them out, you know. <laughs> Big and Rich's performance for the 8th of November video was done on a revolving stage in Nashville in front of a green screen, which would later become the canvas for the 40-year-old images which told the story best. In addition, a private home was found which was strikingly similar to Niles' own home in Deadwood, South Dakota. Niles loves the open road and drove himself down from Deadwood in a 1959 TR3A that he's had for years. Chris Christofferson's introduction to the video was done on a soundstage in Los Angeles. But for everyone involved, the mission was the same, to honor the fallen and wounded by honoring the story. It is Niles' story, and it's, it's about one man. But it's also, like John Rich says, everybody knows that Niles, in different wars or different times, or in the Vietnam War, it went through these kind of things. And it's a huge responsibility on our part to take these things and make it real, real as possible. This is not just a job. This is something that we have to get right. On the 8th of November, the angels were crying as they carried his brothers away. With the fire raining down and the hell all around, there were few men left standing that day. These guys came back to not a friendly welcome. And nowadays, you know, we wave our flag and we hold our veterans and the people who are over there fighting now in esteem. And these guys weren't held that way during that time period. There were a lot of the country that was, were glad they were there. There were a lot of the country that didn't understand why they were there. So now is the time that we get to pay back those veterans too that didn't get to come back to a good welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Miles Harris. The man who just wrote that song about the 8th of November. The true American unsung hero right here. As his brothers are as well. This is what we got in my top hat. Miles, hey boy, come back here, man. We're going to.
going to take a trip over to Vietnam and, and um, go to the, the area, War Zone D, uh, where the, the actual battle was fought. And um, you know, Niles is going to Niles is going to show us where it went down. I got my jungle boots. That that's all I came back with from Vietnam. They're in the garage, and uh, we're going to leave them in Nam. They got the mud on them from Nam. Uh, you know, they cut them off uh, 40 years ago. Wow. Yeah, they're going to stay in Nam though. This time. Yeah. <laughs> this time they're going and not coming back. Leave them yeah. There. Yeah. Awesome. And I won't be in them. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I'm just going to roll it, boys. I've seen it 10 times today. It's just oh, freaking yeah. out. Okay. I want to see it again because it's always and steady, you know? After viewing the video, it was time to head to the airport and start the long trip to Hill 65, War Zone D. We're checking here in at Nashville right now, and then we're going to LA, and then on to Hong Kong, and then on to Ho Chi Minh. So there you go. They're going to do it all for us. So cool. right here, passports right here. Yeah. Lots of stuff to do. These are amazing. In regard to your letter of 8 September 2005, number 144, requesting permission for six people to enter and exit Vietnam for the purpose of sea crewman exchange, the Immigration Department stuff responds as follows. Dong Yi Cho Six Hap Nap Khan Dan Sak Kem Pio. We're in. We're in. The main word you need to know is Dong, because that's how people buy, sell, and trade, by Dong. The American dollar is worth approximately how many dongs? No, oh, about 100,000, I don't know. 100,000 dongs. The flight from Nashville to Los Angeles left at 5 p.m. on September 14th. Once you walk into the Los Angeles International Terminal, it begins to feel very much like a foreign country. What's, how many dongs to a dollar? So Big Henny and I have a plan. Yeah. You know, John Rich. He can be uh, a pain in the ass. We can throttle him on Vietnamese soil and there will be no repercussions in the U.S. legal system. Arrival in Hong Kong was 15 hours later. In Hong Kong. The country boys have arrived in Hong Kong. After a relatively short trip from Hong Kong to Ho Chi Minh City, the South Dakota Tennessee contingency was met by the Vietnamese production crew, and two worlds immediately began the process of getting acquainted. After some 34 hours of air travel covering 18 time zones and crossing the international dateline, the comfortable bed in the hotel was a welcome sight. Wow. This is cool. But knowing one of the worst choices you can make is to close your eyes in the early afternoon, 9,000 miles from where you normally sleep, the group decided to stay awake and see some of the town at street level. Niles is a huge collector of war memorabilia, especially patches, and we found this flea market kind of place. This Vietnamese man opened up a box full of patches, and uh, there were hundreds of them in there, and Niles just couldn't believe all the patches in there, a lot of them he recognized but had never been able to find in America. So Mark just bought the entire book for him. And uh, Niles was like a kid in a candy store. I've been in many Army Navy stores, but this is the first one I've been in where I saw things that I know came off of bodies of American soldiers some 40 years ago. You took 44? 45, okay. 42, 50. Exchange rates come quickly for managers. 500,000 is 35. That's 35. Oh, I know how to do that. That's 42. Home Depot ain't got nothing on this place, man. Nothing. He said there's 2 million motorcycle scooters in this town. 8 million people in the town, 2 million motor scooters. Only 100,000 cars. 
It's a experience that you can't imagine a lifetime unless you've been there doing it, riding right in the middle of it. And let me tell you, every second you do it, you're taking your life in your own hands. So uh, you definitely want to be with an experienced driver, for sure. So this is Crazy Slang Wang driving this truck right here. Right. I just learned how to say, you're crazy, Wang. Ang dang, ang dang quad. Ang dang quad, Wang. Ang dang quad. It's a little bit like Ashland City. This has been a two-hour game of chicken. Hang on, hang on. Oh, wow. Oh. I feel like I'm in the middle of a movie. When our veterans came home from every other war, the military personnel were treated with a lot of respect. And in Vietnam, we didn't do it. So our guys never got a chance to be appreciated. Part of the reason we're doing this is to give our American <laughs> Vietnam veterans a chance for respect and recognition yeah. for their contribution. Mm -hmm. Now, Niles has not completely moved past that wall, so you understand. My friend Bell was up front, and they were chopping people up machetes, our wounded. And there was no wounded, uh, uh, or you know, when they come across, those folks up front uh, were, were killed. They were murdered and all that shit. And, uh, like I said, I'm not gonna be a jerk over there and all that stuff, but uh, uh, I ain't forgot. You know, I shake hands, how you do, you know, we're both soldiers, but you know, I ain't forgot and I ain't there to kiss their ass or anything, but you know, I'm not there to start another war, <laughs> especially in their backyard. I learned from Custer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we're not trying to stage some meeting of an American yeah. and a Viet Cong, that's not what yeah, we're trying to do. Yeah. We're just trying to tell a story. Early the next morning, the buses headed out for the Mekong Delta region, two hours south of the city. One of the objectives was to try to gain a better understanding of the people and hopefully draw closer to them. And the best way to get close to a culture that lives on water is by boat. The miles and miles of interconnected canals and rivers are referred to as the green lungs of the Mekong. Kanto province is located 170 clicks south of Ho Chi Minh City on the south bank of the Hao River. The river is considered to be the benefactor of the area as its yearly floods deposit huge quantities of nutrient-rich sediment on the rice fields which sustain the country. This is a continuation of the world's largest flea market. It is there that the population of two million people live and work. Everything is concentrated on or near the water. The floating markets are the hub of commerce where the products are identified by hoisting them on a pole to be easily seen. One could only guess what memories and images were starting to flood into Nile's mind. Here he was, 40 years later, back where so much was lost, hoping to find some kind of closure to that dark memory that haunted him all these years. <laughs> Kenny and John continued to do what they had done for the entire trip, to put Niles as much at ease as possible. They did so by just being themselves, seriously committed friends who find no logic in doing anything halfway. This is some cool new shit. Sure they're not just rubber? <laughs> I don't think so. They put rice alcohol on top of baby cobras, green snakes. You just don't know whether you need a scorpion like that or a scorpion like this, whether you want a cobra with a snake in its mouth. It's just so hard to pick out. Actually, this is really crazy and they've already offered me this like 10 times and if Kenny's, if Kenny will do it, I'll do it. Well, here you go. This is Big and Rich drinking a shot of snake juice. Right there, right there. To our good, our good to little good cobra friend, friend from cobra. Vietnam. Here's to you, cowboy. Yo! Yo! Is this what having a Big and Rich time is all about? <laughs> Vietnam? You want to hang with us kids, you got to get real with it. Here's to you, Big. All right. Cheers. Oh, 
Oh, I feel it's strong. Like, it's like rice moonshine. That is rice moonshine. Mark? Cheers, brother. Ooh, that's got a little edge on it. Bad, though. Bad. That looks really, really cool. I'm sweating in it. How about that cobra whiskey? How about that cobra shine? <laughs> cobra shine. Snake shine, man. We drink snake shine. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I got a little buzz up of it, actually. I know it got me. I think one more shot, I'd be good. Woo! 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 Steven Seagal. It's Steven Seagal, man. Steven, it's Cowboy Seagal. <laughs> <laughs> We're dealing in dong, not dollars. It's very important. <laughs> this is a lot of dong. I'm a dong a millionaire. A donganaire, they would call it. <laughs> Got lots of dong. <laughs> Yo! <laughs> we got some, we got your cobras, bitch. I, I just hope all this stuff fits. You know, we just bought like, oh, I don't know. At least 50. Thousand billion dong, dong worth of clothes. fifty billion dong. <laughs> you know what worth I was clothes. just thinking though, because you really can't, you really can't try anything on here. I bet the lines the day after Christmas here are absolutely insane. insane. <laughs> you give me back my dong. I spent too much. Come on, give me back my dong. Give me back my dong. Give me back my dong. I blew my dong. Well, I'll tell you what, that snake shot started kicking in. We only had one shot, but that was some potent stuff. He's an Asian man. He's an Asian man. Oh, on the river, me call. Big Kenny, I'm starting to feel a little creative. Yes, I think that Mekong River snake shine's been kicked in in a big way. And a one. And, and a two. And a three. And a three. Well, we blew our dog. Mekong River, we drank snake shine liquor. Gotta get the Ho Chi Man to get some money again. Cause we blew our dong in Vietnam. Oh, tag it, Kenny. Tag it, yeah, we blew our dong in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> From the river, all you see is, you know, people selling stuff and all that. You walk back in there a few hundred yards and there's neighborhoods. It's like they live in a whole different time period. It's like going back in time 40 years. You think we have enough cameras? I hope so. <laughs> what a beautiful place. Everyone seems to be happy, doing whatever they're doing. They really seem to be a joyful people. Very cordial to us as visitors. Very inviting into their private space. This is a, the wrapping uh, stuff that's wrapping the spring roll that we eat. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and then put it on the stove. Oh, <laughs> 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 Kenny, I know, and really enjoyed getting to sit down and cook a little bit with the natives. Because, you know, his mom in Virginia, oh, Lord have mercy, she would have showed up there. She would have been cooking that rice paper right with old Big Kenny. So would my granny. She would have been cooking with him, too. I got you covered. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Well, as we traveled, the Vietnamese people were so kind as to show us a little bit of their culture everywhere we went. We even got to experience some original Vietnamese folk music. 
Oh, it's beautiful. It was kind of storming, pretty heavy rain outside. I noticed old Niles just kind of walk away. I guess he was needing to find a little time to reflect. That dude stood out there and let the rain just pour right down on him. I guess it took him back about 40 years. Well, I tell you what, that was some of the best Vietnamese music I'd ever heard because, well, it was the only Vietnamese music I'd ever heard. And, well, we thought they'd been so cordial to us, we'd return the favor. With a little bit more of that rice moonshine, by God, here we go. Like they do out in They were being very polite and clapping along, but of course they had no idea what in the hell we were saying. The road leading to the small village near Hill 65 was rutted and muddy the next morning. It hadn't changed much in 40 years. These were the first white faces to be seen in this village since 1975. Gifts had been brought for the children, and who better to distribute them but the biggest kid in the group, Big Kenny. Yo, yo, I will Everybody get some? <laughs> Here we go. Oh, here we go. There we go. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome very much. Thank you very much. Everyone was welcomed with honest, open smiles and lots of laughter. <laughs> The lives of the local people seem to be consumed with caring for the land and each other. The result is a very peaceful contentedness that is not so easily found in the bustle of the city. The spy that helped arrange the ambush on November 8, 1965, has aged into the patriarch of the community. Through our translator, we learned it was he who had connected the North Vietnamese Army with the Viet Cong, and together, they silently waited for the unsuspecting foot soldiers of the 173rd. The commander of the Viet Cong forces on November 8th has been retired from the military for a few years and is now a ranking Communist Party official. His account of the battle lines up perfectly with Niles, except for the fact that he was on the other side of the ambush. Okay. You know, this old man was a spy for the North Vietnamese Army and didn't want to be. He was forced to do that. The communists would threaten bodily harm to them and their families if they didn't help them. There you go. Yeah. What a sweet old man. He didn't want to set up an ambush, but he had to. You know, that was something that was forced into it, some of the horrors of war. Uno, dos, tres. Here. The river was way back there. This is rainy season. We got here in November. It was dry. At that time, when they landed those ships anywhere, it was like hitting a wall. You cut a hole in the jungle. They tell you, get over there, get over there. Do that. Uh, lay down fire. Way. Yeah, lay down fire. Get out of there. If, they're, if you're in a line of fire, if they see a sniper, they know those rounds come from a certain mm -hmm. way. The but there's such mass confusion. You might have three different guys, and they count their steps. And the average step is two and a half feet. Mm -hmm. And then they would ask, you know, how many steps have you done? 600, whatever it is. So you got the pacers, you got the asthma, 
Well, you keep doing this because you are going around stuff. Mm -hmm. That was a whole war. We're going 1,200 meters out of way, or we're going to a bill, we're going to check it out, or somebody said there was some tunnels, or this or that. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. We just went, went hunting. Yeah, hey, yeah. Santa, here we are in, in, in Vietnam. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. So now, the moral to the story is, you got to be careful who you give your hat to. Yeah, you're telling me. You might man. wind up yeah. back in Vietnam, man. <laughs> no fun. <laughs> Let's find a hole. This would be a good place to, to well, find a hole of yeah. a B-52. Bomb mm hole -hmm. of B-52. Because see, like I said, they were much bigger, and when they went off in the jungle, yeah. Yeah. there was a wall, I mean, of debris, you know. You, you just shred just, everything they around. They dumped a whole bunch of ordnance on that, uh -huh. that night and all that during the walk, during the battle. Unbelievable. Yeah, that, that hole. We're right down in the bottom of a B-52 hole, and we're going to dig us another hole. Yeah. Plant these and plant them. A, Man, that is just wicked. Everything in the jungle and bites you or sticks you. And then they threw in some extra stuff. Guys with guns. Yes. Yeah. Let's yeah. dig a hole right here. Right there. Right there. Where? That's the spot. This one's for you, cowboy. Yeah. Okay. This, this partly makes up the drag in the eye. Right? <laughs> oh, you got another three, two or three feet. I got you. Don't I'll worry. Can he get tired? This is a whole lot better than that spoon Daddy used to give me. <laughs> That's deep enough. Not a sandbox out back. <laughs> I would just go out there when I was like four years old and just dig, 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 dig. And uh, my grandma used to come out and always go, what are you trying to dig yourself a hole to China? Yeah, you it here. just so happens right now, yeah. I think we got I'm here. trying to dig back to Virginia right now. <laughs> is this a big and rich moment? This is big and rich, dude. Now, this is Being happening. here with you is about as big as it gets, brother. That's it, brother. <laughs> That's it, brother. Love you, man. What do you think, now? Good. We'll let you do the honor. All right, we're planting these babies. I heard. Well, they carry these things for 40 years around, you know. And uh, they sent these boots back with me when I got shot. And uh, they followed me to Belly Forge General Hospital in Pennsylvania. And uh, that's all I got back. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's these boots. They, they, they cut this one off. You see, they, they, yeah. they got blood on it a little bit. Old time stained, blood. Yeah. And that mud came from here. Yeah, that mud came from right here. This is on. This is D zone. I'm planting these bad dudes. A lot of guys got planted here too. It's, they're all in your song and yep. pictures of them. Let's put them away. Goodbye. Here you go. Sit that on top. Of Get a there. picture of that. Put on the heel. Being there um, when we buried Niles' boots, in number one, we were sitting, we, were, we buried them in the bottom of a crater made by a bomb from a B 52. The hole was 10 feet deep still. I was I was definitely moved by the impact of just the, the whole story and, and everything that he told me, the culmination, the hell and the, the terror of the fight that day and, and as a young man what he must have, have felt at that time. I mean, you know, this happened to Niles when he was nineteen years old, you know, he's over sixty now. It was a lot of years ago, but you know, he still the story just still how could you ever remove something like that from your head? I was more than anything just just feeling him and glad to be there and, and standing beside him and, and uh, you know I, I was praying. Our home was a poncho. Uh, if you had a partner there, you know, one guy would usually put the poncho on the ground and the other uh, guy's poncho would be your cover. There was uh, for uh, but our our home was mud. The battle site where the operation took place was uh, just a hunk of jungle. It was a piece of jungle where they had reports of enemy activity. The American folk was stationed at the foot of the hill. The local people call it the hill of Phong Soi. And when we say a hill, it's a very easy hill. It's not some mountain or anything. It was a, a slide hill in the jungle. I saw where the Americans were, and I took the NVA there. Everybody's up and ready at first light. 
on our side we dug hole and got ready to ambush. We were at our position and when the American came close, we opened fire. The whole jungle exploded and machine guns opened up. They opened up with 50 cows, 30 cows and a lot of small arms fire. And then machine gun, submachine gun, automatic rifles, hand grenades, artillery, all fight at once with full force. I know because I was there. The whole jungle blew up. I was nailed instantly. I was, uh, I was, I can't remember, second, third, fourth man in the line. Everybody got nailed. Everybody was killed or, or wounded. When I got blown over, I was blown over on my back, and I just had my shotgun. And like I said, I was tore up pretty bad this way. So I stayed on my back, and I was uh, sort of like they were, they were up in trees and stuff. I blew a few rounds through the trees with the shotgun, but uh, bullets were whizzing. With the reports I read, they said that we had at least 1,200 facing us, North Vietnamese soldiers facing us. We started, the company was probably a total of 200, our Charlie company. But the people out in the initial shootout was 40 of us. What's that, 30 to 1? At that uh, battle, many Americans died. Some of the other shootouts we were involved in were not that intense. And um, um, this was just a complete roar for eight hours. We were there by ourselves as far as we, we knew. It was our 30 people, 40 guys, and uh, we were fighting for our life. Uh, uh, it was so intense with the uh, firepower that um, uh, it's all right, take, just take a break. that uh, nothing got through. Well, how about, before we cover this up, since uh, your song's about you going out and toasting all your, yeah. your brothers, man, well, we brought out a little, hey, little toast all for them. Right. Okay, now this, this ain't tea. This, this ain't, ain't tea. tea. Okay. <laughs> Joan's gonna do the honors here, pouring. This ain't tea. Right. Here's a little bit of good stuff. We can do a couple of takes if need be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ain't gonna hurt your feelings, right? You wanna do the honors of making a toast, brother? Right. To the boys from the herd, the guys got dropped here. Airborne. 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 Here's to you. Right. We think about you, remember you, and love you. See, we drop these two then? Yep. Here's to you, boys. Up. Yeah. Wanna help us cover them now? Yeah. We'll cover them gently. Oh. The guys from the herd, 173rd Charlie Company, they're no bullshit. They were the real deal. Yeah. Yeah, bunch of them are. Ended it right here. They're dead and wounded. Here we is. It's over. I think as impressive as it is that Niles did 25 years in the Army, as big as that is, I would say him having to sit in front of a camera, him having to fly back over here, um, him having to go back to war zone D, bury his boots and remember all that mortal hell that went down that day. Uh, his willingness to do that speaks just as much about the man as the fact of what he actually pulled off on November 8th, 1965. And he's doing it not for himself, he's doing it because of the honor he feels for his brethren that didn't make it back. And to me, that's, that's the ultimate patriotic act. I think it's one of those great stories, one of those great things that you happen upon in your life that you know, has a whole journey that it's going on. You, you have no idea. It's kind of like you're just hanging on for dear life and going along with it, just knowing that it's taking you somewhere great. All we did was give it a vehicle for a lot of other people to find out about it. But really, we didn't pull triggers and didn't get triggers pulled at us. All we did was write a little song about it, and that's our contribution. How small is that? I mean, Niles, Niles is walking with a limp, man. You know, he's got a scar this freaking long on his leg. It's a miracle he even lived through it. Um, writing a song about a buddy you met, that's recess.
That was a shootout. I mean, there's a, um, that was our D-Day, and uh, it was a hell of a shootout. And Sonny, a guy by the name of Lovelace, uh, a bunch of others, I was uh, wrapped up, filled up with morphine, and heading out. We were in sheets, and some of them were missing legs, whatever. Those guys had to go to war the next day, Jack. They had to go back. Try that. It ain't if, it's when. You know, how long is your luck going to last? Well, I just say, here's to the boys, man. Yeah, let's here's do the it. Yeah, the 173rd in the D zone. And to Niles for being willing to fly all the way back over to this place that was an absolute hellhole for you. I'm still shocked every time I think about your willingness to come over here and do it, man. So oh, yeah. it's given me and Kenny an opportunity. And honestly, man, it's given millions of people around the world that are going to see this an opportunity to feel what, what you guys went through and, and to recognize your friends and your buddies that, like you said, never came back from here. So here's your song, man. Said goodbye to his mama as he left South Dakota to fight for the red, white, and blue. He was 19 and green with a new M16, just doing what he had to do. He was dropped in the jungle where the choppers would rumble with the smell of napalm in the air. And then the sergeant said, Look up ahead Like a dark evil cloud Twelve hundred came down On him and twenty-nine more They fought for their lives But most of them died In the 173rd Airborne On the 8th of November The angels were crying As they carried his brother The shrapnel that left in his leg He puts on a gray suit over his airborne tattoo And he ties it on one time a year And remembers the fallen as he orders a tall one And swallows it down with his tears On the 8th of November the angels were crying as they carried November 
goodbye to his mama as he left South Dakota to fight for the red, white, and blue. He was 19 and green with a new M16, just doing what he had to do. It had been by far the largest battle for any American unit in Vietnam up until that time. It also created the largest casualty rate. 48 Americans lost their lives, along with 413 of the enemy. For Niles, his life had come full circle. For at least a few minutes in the jungle that day, he was 19 again. 40 years earlier, lying on his back in the jungle, bleeding and suffering. He and his young brothers had fought and struggled with the hearts of aged lions, trying their best to refuse to die. For big and rich, they had done what they had said they would do. By learning all they could from the people there in the time allowed, they had learned about themselves. For everyone on the trip, it had not been just another place to go that you hadn't been before. It had been a chance for their hearts to grow, and in so doing, to fulfill their call. From Big and Rich's point of view, it's about healing. Healing for Vietnam veterans and their families, whose only solace is a beautiful long black wall in Washington, D.C., where the names of the honored dead are engraved in stone. Healing for the millions and millions of Americans who have remembered the dead and forgotten the living. For in healing, there is hope, and in hope, peace.